This video tutorial is all about plant responses to the environment. So plants are obviously living things, and so just like us, they respond to environmental stimuli, changes in the environment. Now they can respond to abiotic factors, so those are like non-living factors, um, such as um, water and light, and they can also respond to biotic factors, so those are living things such as predators. Now there's a variety of different plant responses shown here on the slide, um, I wonder if you recognise any of these. I'm sure you will have seen um, plants kind of growing towards the light, um, perhaps in your homes or in a classroom. Um, you might have also seen um, the Venus flytrap um, snapping shut super quick um, as soon as um, a couple of the hairs within it are triggered, usually as a result of a small insect like a fly. You might have seen um, the plants which when you touch them, they sort of fold in on themselves. Um, a nice example of a nastic response to that. And perhaps um, climbing plants as well in the bottom right, um, you'll have seen um, before as well. Now, before I introduce um, some of these different types of plant responses, I just want you to have a little look at um, the sort of uh, root stem words um, here on the slide. Do you know what any of these mean? Pause the video if you'd like more time. Photo means light, hydro, water, geo means relating to gravity, chemo is chemical, and thigmo is touch. So we have a wide variety of different growth responses in plants um, that we refer to as tropisms. So a tropism is a directional growth response. For phototropism, we have a directional growth response um, towards light or away from light. Positive phototropism would be towards light, negative phototropism would be away from light. For geotropism, that is a growth response um, in response to gravity. So if it's positively geotrophic, you're going to have growth towards gravity, negatively geotrophic, away from gravity. Similarly, with hydrotropism, that is growing towards water. Thigmotropism is um, the touch response, growth response. So that is towards um, whatever's touching it and chemotropism um, growing towards or away from chemicals, depending if it's positive or negative. Now, the key hormone that you need to be um, aware of and understand um, with respect to these growth responses is that of auxin. Now, auxin is responsible for cell elongation in the stems, but it's responsible for inhibiting cell growth in the roots. So a single hormone um, we know has two different effects in two different parts of the plant. And that's shown quite nicely here. So you can see in the roots, you can just about make out in the sort of zoomed in circle image there, um, lots of little red dots on the underside um, of that image in the cells on the bottom side. That Those little red dots are representing auxin. And in the roots, auxin inhibits cell growth. So as a result, the cells in that lower layer um, are going to get shorter relative to the cells on um, the sort of top layer, which will continue to grow as per normal. Now, as a result of that, you end up with a turning down away from light because auxin diffuses away from light. In roots, we then, um, because of this, see negative phototropism. In the stem, by contrast, Auxin is responsible for stimulating cell growth. So again, in that image, you can see um, auxin being represented as those red little dots and the cells that contain the auxin in the stem are elongating. Because the cells are elongating, um, the lower cells there are going to get longer and longer, which is going to cause um, the stem to bend up towards light. So this is why roots are negatively phototrophic and stems are positively phototropic. It's because of the action of auxin inhibiting cell growth in the roots and stimulating cell growth, growth in the stems. So we're gonna have a little look at um, tropism in a little bit more detail then in these two different situations. Um, so in the first image, um, you've got, first of all, um, an even distribution of auxin um, in the stem on the left-hand side. And then we've got a directional light source now, auxin um, is produced at the tip um, and it will accumulate on the shaded side because it diffuses away from light. 
And as we've already mentioned in the stems, auxin is responsible for promoting cell growth. So the cells on the shaded side are going to start elongating. Um, and that is what's going to cause the stem to start bending towards the light. In comparison, in the roots, again, in the first situation, the first root um, image there, we've got an even distribution of auxin. And then in the second image, um, we've got the directional light source. Auxin diffuses away from the light. However, in roots, auxin inhibits cell growth. And so the cells which have that auxin in um, are going to not grow as much as the cells are exposed to the light. And as a result, we've got the bending away from the direction of the light, negative phototropism. For geotropism, we've got um, auxin again being responsible here. Now, auxin um, responds to gravity in that um, it moves in the direction of gravity, so it will move downwards. Auxin initially will have been um, just evenly distributed and then due to gravity it will accumulate um, at the bottom of the stem. Now, auxin promotes growth of cells in stems, as we've mentioned already, um, and as a result, um, in these particular um, stems, we're going to see negative geotropism, and so we're going to see the stems growing away from gravity, so upwards. By contrast, in the roots, again, the auxin is going to accumulate on the bottom side because of gravity. However, in the roots, auxin is responsible for inhibiting cell growth. And because it inhibits cell growth, we're going to end up with the root um, growing down in the direction of um, gravity. So this is an example of positive geotropism. As well as understanding um, the impact of auxin, you also need to be familiar with um, some of the key experiments that were done that enabled us to um, learn more about it. Um, and lots of the experiments were done on coleoptiles. And this image is simply of a coleoptile. We're going to begin by looking at the experiments done by Darwin. Um, then we'll look at um, some of the experiments done slightly later by Boyce and Jensen. And then we'll finish by looking at some of the experiments done by Wendt. So first of all, Darwin. This is um, back in 1880. So the first image is just showing Darwin's initial observation. So this is a coleoptile and the coleoptile is bending in the direction of light. So that's what we've observed. That's what we understand. Darwin then did an experiment where he cut off the tip of the coleoptile. And when he did that, the coleoptile no longer bended in the direction of the light, no longer grew towards the light. In a third um, experiment, or the third setup, um, Darwin um, looked at his coleoptile and then he put a little cover on the tip of it. And he noticed again that the coleoptile did not bend in the direction of light. Based on these um, various experiments, Darwin was able to make a series of um, conclusions. Now, first of all, um, he concluded that a growth stimulus is produced in the tip of the coleoptile, and the growth stimulus is then um, transmitted down from the tip to a zone just below it called the zone of cell elongation. The cells on the shaded side of the coleoptile elongate more than the cells on the other side. The next set of experiments that we're going to look at are those by Boyce and Jensen. Now, Boyce and Jensen introduced permeable and impermeable materials in order to just help us understand a little bit more again about this um, growth response in coleoptiles or in plants. So in the first um, experiment on the far left, he puts a sheet of mica. Now, mica is impermeable to water. He, he slit the sheet of mica just onto the shaded side, so into the shaded side of the plant. When that happened, the coleoptile was unable to bend in the direction of light. We didn't see the curvature response. He then did another experiment where he put this impermeable sheet of mica um, into the exposed side, so the, the side that's um, exposed to the light. And when that happened, he actually did see the curvature response. In his next set of experiments, he um, used sort of a gelatin instead, a kind of like agar gelatin which is permeable to water. He cut off the tip of his coleoptile. He inserted um, a block of gelatin and then replaced the tip of the coleoptile on top. 
And when he did this, um, he observed the curvature response again. Based on his experiments, um, Boyce and Jensen concluded that materials that are um, not permeable to water, so such as the mica, can stop the curvature response in some circumstances, whereas materials which are permeable to water, such as gelatin, do not interfere with the curvature response. Finally, then, the experiments done by Wendt. Now, Wendt um, cut off the tips of the coleoptiles and placed them on agar. And he left them on the agar for some time so that the growth um, stimulus, whatever this thing is, which we now understand to be auxin, um, had time to essentially diffuse out of the coleoptile tips and down into the blocks. He then took the blocks and placed them on the coleoptiles, which had had their tips removed. What Wendt observed was um, the coleoptiles would bend in the dark um, and how much they bent varied depending on the concentration of auxin present in the block. So based on this, um, Wendt concluded that the angle of curvature is related to the concentration of auxin in the block. And the results um, fit nicely with the hypothesis that the curvature response is due to a chemical which moves from the tip and affects cell elongation.